it is true that the presidential election was generally seen to be free, fair, and peaceful. However, there was, in fact, a huge array of election malpractices virtually in all the states of the Federation before the actual voting began. It is incredible. In view of all this, I find the conclusion unfortunate but inescapable that the federal military government is guilty of bad faith, pure and simple. No one has accused me of any offense against any known electoral law or regulation. The people of this country went to polls on Saturday, June 12, 1993, and without let or hindrance, chose me as their president. Didn't they? Well, history back in time, and of course, uh, it's going to be exactly 28 years. Uh, well, this month, uh, when, uh, you know, since Nigerians proved that unity is possible if there is a common goal. Arguably the most significant day in Nigeria's democracy, June 12, is a watershed moment in the history of the biggest black nation in the world. Candidate of the Social Democratic Party, MKR Biola, became a national point of unity, and the denial of his mandate till date is perceived to be Nigeria's biggest undoing. June 12 is now Nigeria's Democracy Day. After a declaration by President Muhammad Buhari in 2018, the events that preceded that historic moment may be repeating themselves in Nigeria. And more than ever, there is an urgent need to sustain Nigeria's democracy. Welcome to Village Square Africa. I'm Suleiman. Well, on June 12, 1993, Nigerians, regardless of tribe or religion, went out en masse to vote for their preferred presidential candidate. The election was between Chief MK Abiola of the Social Democratic Party and Bashir Tofa of the National Republican Convention, NRC. Chief Abiola, according to unofficial election results by many observers and civil societies, won the polls, but he was denied his mandate and the Nigerian people robbed of their choice. It was Nigeria's first election since the military coup of 1983, which coincidentally brought in current President Muhammad Buhari as head of state. At the time, Nigerians seeking democracy for so long were denied a chance at the death. Now, the euphoria, which had been widespread and heavy across the country, was short-lived and the results were never declared. On the 23rd of June 1993, former military president Ibrahim Babangida annulled what's dubbed Nigeria's most peaceful, most free, fairest and most credible election. For many, it's still Nigeria's hope of a true democracy. While June 12 is now Nigeria's Democracy Day following the declaration of President Buhari, Nigerians are yet to benefit from the dividends of 23 years unabated, I uh, mean, I beg your pardon, 22 years unabated democracy. Now, the hope that greeted MK Abiola's candidacy in 1993 was astounding, but the hope of Nigerians in democracy today looks to be deflating. Almost three decades gone, there are still so many leakages and loopholes. On VSA today, we have strong actors in Nigerian politics and those also who partook in that election and uh, to see wh what happened in uh, that uh, particular election and how Nigeria is faring at the moment. Joining me now is Shagun Shoumi. Uh, he's a member of the People's Democratic Party and uh, Moise Banire, a senior advocate of Nigeria. Uh, later on on the show, Fouad Oki, who is a chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, will join us. Uh, gentlemen, good to have you both and thank you for your time and uh, good to see you again on the show. Thank you for having us. Uh, let's start uh, with you, uh, Moise Banure. Uh, I, I'd like us to, first of all, you know, whet the appetite of many Nigerians uh, who were not born then. Uh, interestingly, it was the first time I ever voted. I was the first time voter on that election. Tell us how it went uh, quickly for you on the day, uh, you know, on voting day for you as a Nigerian. Well, it went very well. Unlike now, you know, we had a tourney for them. The election was transparent. Everybody could see who was voting for who. And at the end of the day, you could transparently see the outcome of each 
of the election. That was how it went during that period. All right now that a lot of manipulation took place. But then everybody at each police police could see and count with the polling officials and get the, the, the result properly recorded. And of course, that was why it was even much easier than even now for the result to be aggregated and for the owner and the winner of the election to be determined. So it was uh, in the history of Nigeria the most transparent, the most credible, and the uh, most fair election we've ever had in the history of Nigeria. So it was really, really peaceful, devoid of any toggery as uh, manipulation and all those things that goes on now in the electoral process. Well, and, and show me. Uh, tell us. Uh, I don't know. Did you did you vote on uh, for uh, in June twelve uh, in the June twelve election rather? Well, I was active, but I can't remember actually taking myself out to go and vote on that day. But I know that I was very active and I was old enough to vote. Hmm. Um, what I would just say is that most times when we talk about June twelve, for me, we seem to always be interested in the actual outcome. But I've spent time over the years to ask myself that why was June 12 able to be such a watershed? I think it commemorated in the kinds of plans, build up, the toxic turvy nature of that particular democratic experiment. Remember that a lot of personalities have been in the race, some had been banned, some had been, you know, prevented from going on. The election had moved. So the crescendo in the country was very heavy. Again, we had a national orientation agency that was very powerful, sensitizing people. Generally, the complete mood of the nation, from the activist community to the student unionism, to actual politicians, to the kinds of jingles that were being played, to the pan-Nigerian nature of the movement, remembering men like Yaragua, uh, the senior, and a few others, until we got to June 12. You kind of like felt that if there be anything one wants to remember about June 12, one would just have to ask, what kind of nation carries itself through such a very tedious but interesting process only to truncate it when it was basically the time for them to get the gallant that they deserve for the effort? And uh, of course, um, they then followed very quickly activities that, you know, we now all remember, some we remember a lot with nostalgia, some we remember with the sadness of the personalities that we lost, but more importantly, it set us in a motion where we before long became a parallel nation, it culminated in the Abacha presidency, or the head of state, or junta, and then eventually it ended up with the man dying. So for me, every time people talk about June 12, I see beyond MK Wabiola, I see all the other baby steps that some other personality contributed to the process. I see people whose ambitions were also stopped before we got to the actual election. And I have asked myself one million times, why would any nation go through all that? And at the point when it's supposed to say the freest, the fairest, and the most transparent, because it was option A for, some reasons that up to now is still very opaque. People will give you all sorts of reasons, but the dramatic personality that played there They've not been bold enough to tell us precisely in a believable manner why exactly they sent us in the direction that we have now gone as a nation. I think uh, no doubt uh, you've laid it all bare and uh, I think it has opened the, uh, the floor for discussion looking uh, deeply into all of this. Both of you uh, have been on the square before and uh, because of some of the key things uh, you both raised and uh, that is why uh, we decided to uh, invite you again. I, I recall uh, Moise Bandere, he, he spoke, you know, about some national matters. And uh, June 12th, uh, Moise, uh, is a pointer to what uh, uh, Shomi has also highlighted. He, he's raised some key issues. And some of these issues are still very much with us here today, uh, talking about, uh, you know, issues about religion, issues about ethnicity, uh, and uh, for that particular election, uh, it would seem as if for the first time, Nigerians were almost erasing uh, such, you know, uh, mindset uh, with the uh, ticket of the Social Democratic Party, uh, which a lot of Nigerians didn't care if it was a Muslim-Muslim ticket. Uh, take us through, you know, that process uh, and how we got to 1999, uh, 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 Mr. Banire. Uh, help us make sense of 
did Nigeria learn any lesson from that election or uh, is it as a result of uh, the annulment some interested people who would have uh, guided Nigeria into uh, the future, a better future, uh, left this stage? Well, uh, I'm not too sure we learned anything from that process at all. Like rightly observed, that was an election in which religion did not matter to anybody. That it was one election, ethnicity did not matter to anybody. Everybody went out as Nigerians, as such for the best candidates, and eventually chose the best candidate. Uh, that message ought to have been carried forward or improved upon or consolidated upon, but Regrettably, as a date, the conference has to this nation. Certainly, we are more polarized than ever before along all lines that we can think of. All lines of our diversity, religion, ethnicity, um, tribe, name it. So we never really learned any lesson. Unfortunately, again, those actors who, in my view, were the architect of that misfortune as uh, described, by uh, properly described by uh, Chomi, and the people in my group are still teleguiding, either directly or indirectly, the electoral process in this country today. And unfortunately, that's why we continue to have the situation continue to degenerate every day in the nation because, in the first season, they never met well, they are just bothered about their own selfish end. And that is the agenda they are driving up to now. And that is why every opportunity to emphasize our diversity, of course, they work on it actively. They do everything humanly possible to manipulate the process to reflect the outcome they desire. And that is what we have been witnessing. Unfortunately, it's enduring the nation they owe. It's what has taken us to where we are today. And until those factors, and if possible, by extension, those actors are cleared of the way. We might not see the light in this nation for a while. So my advocacy, by my contention, is that we must find a way, particularly the new elites, to come together and take position, and then action them towards displacing these few, these negligible set of people that are holding the nation back by the jugular. And I think that is the only way forward that I see representing. Thank you. I don't know if uh, show me is back. Okay, yes, because I lost you for a bit there. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you had uh, uh, Banneris submission. Uh, for, for a bit, Nigerians uh, uh, were headed somewhere. And for many Nigerians, uh, uh, the issue of tribe, uh, religion, ethnicity, or even region uh, didn't matter, uh, you know, when Nigerians uh, came together to say enough is enough with military rule. Uh, they wanted uh, democracy. Uh, are, we, are we still on that journey, looking at what has happened, you know, 22 years since I've had this unbroken democracy? Is Nigeria still on that journey to getting, uh, uh, you know, on the path of true through nationalism? I've looked at the landscape, especially those who had a bit of experience on the June 12 struggle and all of that, and those of them who were, you know, metamorphosed into the 1999 democratic experiment. And every time I think about where we are today, with profoundness of respect to his person, I always ask myself, how is it possible for Bola Ahmed Tinubu, more than any one of them, maybe to a lesser extent, Atiku Abubakar, how is it even possible for them to get to 2014, get me? And in 2014, they have been coming from 1999, when a military officer like Obasanjo retired, was you know moving the process and moving the process and moving the process, and they couldn't build a national coalition and suddenly they got to 2014 2015 and a great opportunity presented itself for democrats to build a coalition that can win an election i'm telling you this I, if i see balatin today the one question i'm going to ask him is sir how is it possible for you to be at that threshold and of all the decisions you can take 
The only one you saw and did fit to take was to take even the new next Philip to another military officer who probably can never, by their training and by authorization, be democratic. And look at what we now have. We traveled the PDP route of 1999 with a retired general who did not respect party formation, who wanted it his way on the highway. We got ourselves into him bullying the system, getting a successor. We bullied the system, the successor that somehow we got an, maybe a reluctant president. We managed ourselves until we got to another alternative near big momentum. And they gift it to somebody who there's no democratic credential that can support that decision. So what we have now, is that we traveled from 99 running a so-called military style jackboot teaching new democrats bad habits of not respecting opinions of not building coalitions of not respecting party authority of not respecting constitution we succeeded in getting to 2014 and then in 2014 again when they built another coalition they carried themselves again into the hands of the people who would then behave true to time so what we now have we now have that we traveled the first 16 years, now we have traveled the next six years, and unless we are fooling ourselves, nothing of what we are doing resembles democracy. I can describe it in my words to say that we have instituted a civilian process that allows us to install monarchies. It's like that when you when they get governors, it's like a king, everybody must bow to him, put on to him, he's the wisest, he's the most brilliant. When you have president, is the wisest, is the most brilliant. Tell me, how are we going to get into democracy? For if we had spent the first 16 years on the error of the kinds of institutions that the ambassador built in democracy, why did we make, why did they make the same mistake again? And now, before we will have another opportunity of reverting back to something that can look like a democracy, we will have to work so hard to be able to under, to know, to declaw the, uh, them and, you know, relearn new habits, teach people simple activities of collaboration. Let me jump in here, uh, uh, you know, show me quickly here. Uh, I'm happy uh, Banira is with us here and, uh, and I've also had uh, to see some of his conversations, uh, you know, social media, talking to people, you know, teaching more like, you know, teaching about, you know, politics and democracy and governance. Uh, people asking questions. Uh, 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 good thing you're here today. Listening to show me, uh, it resonates with l the, the, the conversation young Nigerians have been asking. And the question is, how come we have a lot of Democrats? Uh, you have them, especially in the National Assembly. And till this moment, the Constitution uh, that Nigeria is working on hasn't actually uh, been tweaked uh, to get uh, to a, a level where they can say this is uh, a democratically gifted constitution to a people who are in a democracy. Uh, Bani Ray. Well, I didn't know about constitution. Recently, I asked us to write in my column, the constitution, more or less what I would describe as constitutional development in Nigeria. And I did say that if you start from 1992 to date, what you discover is that substantially, in practically all the situation that we have had to move from one constitution to the other, it has to be by way of replacement. In other words, having a brand new constitution until 1999. Since 1999 today, we've been struggling with the present constitution trying to do one amendment or the other. And the more we do that, the more we compound the problem of the Constitution itself. As of today, I can tell you without fear of contradiction that you have a lot of provisions in the 1999 Constitution as amended that are purely unintelligible. We have so many contradictory ones, so many dilatory ones, so many cumbersome provisions within it. And at the end of the day, that is why it's not even working. Like you have said also, is a Constitution not really democratically crafted in the sense that it does not it's not a product of the people it's not that the people congregated together and said this is what we have decided to have for ourselves it was imposed on us by the military then of course that's why he said that each time you look at the preamble the to the 1999 constitution that say we the people then you are seeing fraud already that the thing is undoubtedly a fraudulent document 
So for me, the current exercise is not far off from the same thing. I do not know why we are building, in my very strong view, we are building something or nothing. As far as I'm concerned, we do not ask something to build upon or to amend. In other words, what I'm advocating is that we need a new constitution entirely, particularly in view of the various serious agitators going on all over the country today. They are very fundamental issues that needs to be addressed. Failure to address it will continue to lead to the agitation that we are currently witnessing. We have two major areas now. We have the restructuring advocate, we have the secession. Whichever way you look at it, for me as a person, they are all entitled to their various positions. And I know without fear of contradiction that, that, that the day that we are we are addressing you, that there is no fairness in the system at all. There is no justice in the country. And there's still we have fairness and justice. We are just wasting our time. So the summary of my submission is simply that the current exercise by the National Assembly is a scam. It's simply a jamboree. It's a waste of everybody. That even the way they are going about, look at the property and How do you go and put the property and in a five-star hotel so as for people not to be able to access? And you start regulating those who can talk and giving them with people lot money to address issues that are fundamental. It's just a waste of everybody's time, waste of resources, waste of energy. So for me, honestly speaking, and I think we are able to address the question of our constitution, which is the grand norm upon which all other things are due, we are heading nowhere. And if we are looking at the volume of what we have now, it's appalling. I've told them several, go and check the United States Constitution. It's no more than a pamphlet. It only said with the fundamentals. It's true the subsidiary legislation that we capture all other ISPs. But in our own constitution, even marriage issues, you put inside. Religious issue, you, you put it tight. In fact, it's so bad, unfortunate that it's part of what is militating against the development of the nation. Take the land use act, for example. Land use act governs land. Even if you open land use act today, there is a large, sizable portion of land use act that this with what we call transitional provision. It was meant to just last for about two, three years. Today it's almost 30 something years. It couldn't be amended, it couldn't be removed, it couldn't be improved because you have incorporated it into your constitution. So for now, I do not believe the National Assembly has a direction or a solution to the challenges that is confronting the nation constitutionally. And that is my very strong view. Now, show me. Uh, I saw you, uh, you know, nodding uh, in agreement to some of the things uh, Banire uh, has raised, and you actually started the conversation, letting Nigerians know that some of these people who are key actors uh, presently have somehow, you know, cotoed to uh, the actions and inactions of those who were in the military to the extent that uh, uh, democracy uh, hasn't actually grown as we have seen in Ghana, as we have seen in Kenya and a few other African countries. Uh, has Nigeria learned any lessons, you know, especially from uh, uh, where it's coming from? I, I think my, what I want to say is that when people say that, oh, the Nigerian constitution is from this, it's not the we, the people and all that. I hear, but for me, that's not the big problem because it's not possible for 200 million people to sit down and write a constitution anyway. So it's going to be a few people who will write it on behalf of everybody. You know, my major grouse has been, we've had a national assembly. This national assembly, if they had known precisely what democracy really means, they would have understood that in a democracy, the powers of everything resides with the legislature. And because that power resides with them, they would, would have, over the years, been inspiring and sending quality men. Take the case of Barney Rep, for instance. You are, it, it, it plays around the people that are maybe of the, if you like, progressive side, while I'm of the PDP side. Can you please tell me why any woman being who knows Barney Rep partially, not even too well, will not be thinking that someone like Barney Rep would make a good speaker of the federal house or make a good senator because you are expecting that the best should inspire us in the legislature. What have we done with ourselves? We have reduced our legislature to something that they favor people that are, they don't even know the role, the responsibility and how secret it is. So you now see what we're doing. The thinking of democracy is that even if you have a problem with your constitution or your law, your legislators can listen and hearing what the people are saying 
attempt to make those adjustments. Is it not disgraceful for us as people collectively that between 1999 to date, you have had people talk about fiscal federalism. You have had people talk about devolution of power. You have had people talk about, oh, it's, it's time for us to have multimodal policy. You have people talk about practical things that the only way you can get it done is by a constant, you know, process where the legislator does what they need to do. You pass it through to third of the state house assembly. Can you tell me why we are standing on the same spot, speaking the same language, using the same set of uh, jargon, and at the same time doing exactly the same kind of madness, hoping to get, I don't know, what kind of result? Unfortunately for us now, the chicken has come home to roost. Non-state actors have now seized the minds of our people. Everywhere you turn, you see non-state actors are the ones now driving the popular movement of the citizens. That is to tell us that we have really fumbled. And now that we have agreed that we have fumbled, and we are teaching to a position where we can even begin to split out the country or break it up, nobody wants that. You need people that are smart, you need people that are thorough. You need people that are quite inspired to now lead us out of this mess. Take the case of the constitutional conference, constitutional that they are doing now. I would have thought that for a nation that is having the kind of problems we're having, there's problem in the southeast, there's problem in the southwest, there's problem in the northeast, north center, almost everywhere. Why can't we just do a double blind poll? to even go and ascertain what the Nigerians are demanding and what kind of in things interest them. If we do it very well, we'll hear from every part of the country. We can then get professional, personal crafters to take into consideration what is the commonality of what the Nigerians are saying. But we don't even have the decency to allow them to have a public hearing on these issues. We can't let them ventilate. We can't let them even joke. We can't let them have fun. We can't let them enjoy some minimal body crumb of their freedom, including even their insanity on social media. We have become again a people that is aiding itself into a pariah status. And when you look at the people that are justifying it, you can forgive them. What about the ones that you expect them to know better? They are criminal silence. How do you explain how Democrats who fought for democracy, who were banished into exile, who had to do so much to even take civilian authority. How do you explain why they are mooted? Why the whole thing is going on? So for me, what we have been doing is that we have been having some form of governance. You can even rate them on the quality of the participation and the quality of the deliverable and relative to the monies we are wasting all over the place and the kind of misdirected joke we are doing. Well, we are not yet in democracy. For us to be in democracy, we must understand that it is a journey. But it's not a journey that leads you back into draconian dictatorship or a concept where the president is so powerful, more powerful than everybody around him, or the governor is so fair, he has to be bowed to, or party leaders have reduced themselves into a five drum of they're the only ones that know only their lackeys can, can progress. Now we have a country of almost 200 million people, bright guys outside the country, sharp people within the country, but ha, why is our system not throwing them off? I think that's another so aspect. Our democracy that, that's a, that's a, that's needs a, to sorry, go sorry on to call, a major reset. So, sorry to cut in uh, there, uh, show me. That's a brilliant, you know, question you've asked, and I'm happy uh, Bandera will also help us here. Is it right to say, uh, Bandera, that uh, uh, there seem to be a hijack? Uh, there are people who have hijacked the process because if you're talking about uh, some people that should be able to have uh, done, uh, you know, the right things in a democracy, even when some of these people are elected, uh, they fail to do the, the needful, uh, you know, democratically to ensuring that the people uh, get, uh, you know, a better democracy. For instance, look at uh, the National Assembly. Some key individuals who are uh, who've been tested and trusted, once they get into office, as uh, uh, Show Me rightly said, there's this uh, silence uh, that we see. Is there a hijack of the process? Well, it's very right that it's an hijack at all the levels of the political process in Nigeria. We have so many cabals. Uh, in the first instance, the emergence of these people in the first instance, like I said, the quality of the people we have at the National Assembly is very poor. And it's poor because of the activities of the Godfathers. They do not seek to apply merit at any level in determining those to represent the people. What they seek most times is to find somebody who, according to them, is a loyal person. 
But in my view, they need a cycle fund who they will use for that purpose. And unfortunately for us, these people that have adapted those processes at various level, I alluded to it in my introductory remark that over time, they were the same set of people that in the first instance truncated the June 12 election. And they are still the same people substantially that are still our debate right now. And that is why I said, in a video, we must find a way to displace these people by all means. There must be a mass movement to displace them. They are still in charge, largely. And for those other people that you seem to believe that, okay, this, some of these people have some modicum of integrity in them, proud to go into that. But by that, they get, they get easily compromised by the process. They lose their voice immediately. They go into the moot uh, uh, section. And this is why, because of the compromise, and I tell you, it's not so much of their fault. It's because, again, Nigerians as electorate, we fail to continuously demand accountability and probity. We fail to speak up when we should. We fail to ask questions when we should. So at the end of the day, they get away with all these things. And I believe that as we start or we wake up and start asking them and start challenging them, that is where we get to our destination. And like uh, Tome said, you see, there's something called referendum, which we all know. To test the fact that to validate a constitution as a people's constitution, you probably need a, you certainly need a referendum to be done. No matter who must have worked on it, maybe constituent assembly, a group of experts and so on, at the end of the day, there must be a referendum. In Kenya that we alluded to initially, their constitutional process took some time, but ended up with a referendum. In South Africa, that one is even another dimension. It's equally it took a long process, but their own is even that at this stage of the development, all the positions are legally tested in court for the court to validate whether they are in consonance with the dictate or the expectation of the people or otherwise. So we have so many options to tap from, but the reality of the situation we have found ourselves is that the National Assembly we have now cannot give us what we desire. They lack the capacity, they lack the, 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 the thought, and they lack that passion to be able to get us this to this where we have to be. So for me, I've always advocated to it. That constitutional conference convened by uh, the former president, Jonathan, that document, I've had the opportunity of going through it. And I found it very, very, very rich enough to be able to build something upon. We are equally, if you cannot, for whatever reason, I don't know, even when I was in the party, I was still with APC, I used to ask that question, that why are we jettisoning this report? Why, why, why? Simply because somebody else did it and you don't want that person to take the glory, then you throw away the baby and the bathwater. Then again, if you can't do that, the agitation that is going on requires impact compulsorily aggregation of opinion, a consensus building, which again requires the convening of another conference if you don't want to direct come with that of Jonathan. We must do another one. Without doing it, we are not going anywhere. The, these people are the present national assembly. They are not representing anybody. They are just representing themselves. How many of them even live within their constituency? How many of them return to their constituency? How many reflect the views of their constituency in their submission before the house? None. So for me, we have to just open a new fiesta entirely. And the new fiesta requires mass movement of people of like mind across board within the country to be able to displace those mafia that I earlier on alluded to. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, show me close this for us. Uh, how can Nigeria get a true uh, representative democracy uh, going forward? First, just first, we have to first of all understand that if we, if the intention is to have all the people buy in and have them also weigh in how they are, they are going to choose their leaders, how do they want to lead, do they want federalism, do they want, uh, yeah, you know, parliament, whatever you think they may be saying. We must be careful that we don't allow the loudness of the majority elite, minority elite, to think that that's the voice of the whole country. So it means that we must painstakingly take time out to listen to all the sections. We have more than maybe 270, 300 tribes in this country. And all of them have one thing or the other to say. But I can assure you, there will be a lot of commonality. What is the, you know, the vision that all Nigerians can connect to and all Nigerians can see their role in it and what they are to expect from it? These are the minimum things you, first of all, agree. 
Those who wrote the Federalist Papers, who are the drafters and the fathers of American constitutional democracy, they have one objective in mind. They didn't want a monarch, but they also want the diligent capacity of a parliamentary system. So what did they do? They created a presidential system, but also created a lot of checks and balances for it. And they made sure that they didn't have to start writing every line on the thing. Oh, you cannot fish. Oh, you cannot sell that. They felt it was not necessary. And they allowed themselves to have the robustness of a judiciary. Now, my dear friend, and is there, who is my resident, and they said, can you tell me truthfully that when he looks at the area of men that are sitting on the Supreme Court today, and a few of those of them in the Supreme Court of Appeal, can you tell me that in this day inspire him? You wonder how some of them even got there. When you read some of the judgments they write, you'll be wondering, did this people don't even understand what they're standing on, that their judgment is supposed to be validation of themselves in immortality. If the judgment is sound and the jurisprudence that backs it up is also sound. But what do we have? So it means that we can't get any escape or hope in the judiciary. We're not going to get much from the people's representative in the legislature. And the executive have turned themselves into kings. In fact, emperor in some cases. I see governors, you can't agree with them. You can't, dis you can't disagree with them. I see president who don't understand that you know. moderation, refrain, you know, carefulness, taking people on board, building consensus, making all stakeholders feel wanted and interested and being part of the country. I see people speaking on behalf of government who don't understand that their duty is to explain, not to speak at people. And almost every government, you just well, see that. Well, uh, I think, uh, I think the, the, the exciting thing here is that uh, it has also afforded uh, Nigerians more time to bring back, uh, you know, these conversations. And I'm so excited that... Uh, uh, Moise uh, Banira and yourself have raised, <clears throat> both raised something very key and germane on how the people, you know, can legally, uh, ultimately uh, take back, you know, and safeguard democracy. It's a fine place for us to say thank you for being such a nice company, for giving us your time in such an uh, auspicious moment. Uh, Moise Banira and uh, uh, show me. I'd I like to thank you again for your time. Uh, coming up next is uh, Fuad Oki. He joins us uh, to also look at the issues here on the square. Stay with us. Quite an interesting conversation uh, we're having here on the square today and of course uh, looking at the uh, key things uh, being addressed uh, by uh, uh, Moise Banire and Shagun Shomi earlier on uh, tells uh, a, a big story about Nigeria and uh, the quest for its democracy to be so sustained and of course uh, also talking about uh, uh, representative you know democracy and uh, the need for the country to also uh, rejig its constitution, uh, which, uh, according to uh, Banire, uh, doesn't actually reflect, uh, you know, the people. And of course, uh, those also represent the people in the National Assembly. That's the Parliament of Nigeria, uh, aren't also representing the people. Uh, we have um, Fuad Oki joining me now. He's uh, uh, a chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, and uh, we'll be looking at some of the uh, key things. Uh, on the day. Uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, on June 6, uh, 2018, just eight days after the format Democracy Day, 
On May 29, President Buhari announced June 12 as the new Democracy Day. He also formally recognized Chief Abiola as the winner of the presidential election in 1993. Chief Abiola you know, breasted the tape and defeated his opponent, but his victory would never come in his lifetime. On July 7th, uh, 1998, Chief Abiola, the man who had restored Nigerians' hope, died in suspicious circumstances barely a month after the death of former head of state Sani Abacha. Abacha became the head of state after overthrowing the interim national government of Ernest Shoneko on November 7. Also in 1993, Shoneko had been appointed the leader of the interim national government in Nigeria on August 26, also in the year 1993 by Babangida. Nigeria has had five civilian presidents since 1979, and none is more respected than the man who was never allowed to emerge. Now, with Nigeria's democracy being faced with more questions than ever, and the constituent parts of the nation at loggerheads, insecurity on the rise, unemployment soaring, businesses struggling to cope with the times, citizens not feeling protected, and tribes seeking secession and exits from nationhood, there isn't a better time that needs the hope like that which existed on June 12, 1993. I'm hoping, the, well, by now, we should be uh, able to have uh, Fouad Oki uh, live uh, joining me now. Fouad Oki is uh, a chieftain of the All Progressives Congress. Uh, good to have you join me, uh, uh, Fouad Oki. Well, we'll take a moment. Seem to be having some issues uh, having that connection to Fuad Okay, We'll take a moment. Uh, we'll come back shortly. Stay with us. Well, Fuad Oki joins me now. He's a chieftain of the All Progressives Congress. Uh, Mr. Oki, many thanks for joining me and uh, apologies uh, for that glitch, uh, for our inability to connect uh, uh, via Zoom uh, on the video call. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Lionel. Well, uh, well, a while ago, we started off the show with uh, Muiz Banire and Shagun Shoumi looking at Nigeria's democracy, especially now that, uh, well, Democracy Day is just around the corner. But uh, quite frankly, both of them uh, did say, you know, did give some key things uh, about Nigeria. First, talking about uh, our type of democracy, looking at the constitution, where they also said that, that uh, it would seem as if uh, the democracy uh, has been hijacked by some people, making it almost impossible uh, for the country uh, to rejig and retrick the constitution. Uh, tell us uh, your submission uh, looking at uh, the way forward for Nigeria in sustaining and growing its democracy. Uh, unfortunately, it's been a sweet and sour experience. And if you ask me, I'll tell you that we need to rejig the, the OT, not just about our constitution, but also about a uh, value system. But talking about the constitution, we need to learn from other clients. I I listened to what showed me a little to about the American system, you know, or the Republican democratic system, which we seem to copy in Nigeria. Uh, uh, we, we copy things without really understanding the social, cultural on that thing. And uh, for me, I think the only way for us to go is to reject that constitution. I remember a few years ago I was in some place and one of them said, listen, we have more than enough reports on the shelf for us to learn from. This constitution, in all honesty, will not take us too far. And that's the truth. You know, uh, talking about the constitution is one thing. Also talking about those who are being tasked with, uh, you know, 
rejigging this first looking at the national assembly talking about the representative of the people let's start first by talking about grassroots governance uh, in every democracy uh, they say it is local politics is local first uh, before you start looking at uh, well the big politics has nigeria done well you know locally grassroots wise growing its democracy what i'll do is for us to understand clearly let us localize it to lagos and the question is in the last 21 years in good conscience can we say that we've clearly had you know a quality political leadership no what we have in lagos has been mercantile and so when you look at that and you recall our last discussion Suleiman, where i said we must all accept the fact that lagos is nigeria and nigeria is lagos nigerian political development started from lagos and unless we get it right in lagos we will not get it we will not get it right if we don't have a robust political system at the grassroots level it's called the first nation that is the nation known to the people that is the nation where representation politics representation democracy need to be at its best so we, we should take a look at lagos as a case story and you realize it's nothing to write on about the only thing we can write about the last 21 years in grassroots democracy it's you know understanding political mercantile where like the chicago machine of the late 50s and early 60s where all sorts of individuals you know and the questionable characters flaunting democratic credentials that are nothing but tyranny chaos that's all that we can do we can point to the last 21 years of our democracy there's nothing absolutely nothing in terms of deepening or indeed developing robust democratic system at the grassroots level let, let, and it's part of the value system which i alluded to earlier and I these see. are the things we must first agree that we need to reject the constitution in rejecting the constitution we will talk about leadership and that's the way i think we need to go you know quickly because uh, we're almost out of time now I i'm hoping that we, we we can also have this conversation you know in the days ahead but uh in closing uh, this uh, you, you have actually you know reduced this uh, to uh, the leadership recruitment process uh, i want you to you know give a sense of what uh, direction you would love uh, to see nigeria go uh, especially in grassroots democracy leadership recruitment process uh, so that, that's a fine place for us to close if you can touch on that quickly yeah it's for us to ensure that the electoral act as amended or being amended is you know passed into law which speaks to just one thing internal democracy which will speak to how we choose leadership at the grassroots and respect for the rule of law and that's what is so imminent that we need to do when parties will respect their own rules when the issue of justice, of fairness, and equity will prevail. And that's the only way for us to choose appropriate leadership at the grassroots that will begin to change, you know, um, uh, the narrative and create a new political trajectory that will get us there. Well, I think uh, it's a fine place for me to say many thanks for being such nice company. Against all odds, uh, you made it to the program. Many thanks, uh, Fouad Oki. It's my pleasure. Well, uh, Fouad Oki, a chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, and uh, that's uh, where we leave it today. Don't forget that uh, democracy uh, simply means, uh, you know, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But the question is, does this apply in Nigeria? Think about it. 
So once again, thanks to my guest on the show. The conversation continues tomorrow. See you then.